All right, so now that we have spent so much time talking about evolution and why evolution occurs, how it occurs, um, and what it leads to, I want to spend some time talking about how we can kind of visually represent that evolution. So I need to introduce you to something called a phylogeny, and you've been seeing these before, so it's not something that's brand new, but it is something that I need you to start being able to analyze and at times create given some information. So phylogenies just show how organisms are linked together, how it, sh it shows their evolutionary relationship. So basically how closely related are they and who their most common ancestor is when that evolved, etc. And so you're going to see a lot of different phylogenies throughout the course of all of evolution, right? You already have seen a lot, um, but you also need to be able to analyze a lot of these phylogenies, not just see them, right? So phylogeny is basically the area of biology that shows how things are evolutionarily related. And this can be constructed, like these trees can be constructed using morphological, so like physical data. It can be with chemical data and it can be with genetic evidence. So it could be like DNA, right? And so generally your best bet is to use DNA, but sometimes you don't have DNA, right? Like if you're given a fossil, they don't generally contain DNA that you can use. So generally you're going to have to rely on morphological structures. So as we start talking about phylogenies, your book breaks down the three domains of life, right? So there are the three big categories of living things, and those are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. So bacteria is our like most, it's our most basal or oldest, most ancestral, if you will, um, form of life that we're going to be typically talking about. We don't really spend much time talking about archaea. They are a really, really cool group of organisms, but there's not that many of them anymore. Um, and so we generally will focus on eukaryotes and then talk a little bit about bacteria as we've been doing this year. So phylogenetic trees are diagrams that represent those relationships, right? And the branches are proportional to how much evolutionary time has passed. So the further apart some branches are, that means that they evolved further back, right? So what I like to do is visualize an axis. Anytime I look at a phylogeny, here we have, you know, the origin of Earth or the origin of life way, way, way back at the beginning. And then as you move away, your time is moving forward. So like the tips of the branches are present day. Okay, and so that's gonna become really, really clear as we look at a more basic tree like this one. Here we have time further back. So this is further back. And then as you move up, you're moving towards the present. Okay, and then the tips of the trees like right here, right here, right here, etc. Those are all going to be the present day organisms. Okay? And so cladistics is basically our system of classifying these organisms. And it differs from phylogenetic trees. So like phylogenetic trees are often sometimes called cladograms. Um, they're technically different, but for us, they're going to be the same thing. It's basically like our representation, our visual representation of the relationships, right? But then as you actually make these trees, we're going to start looking at clades. So clades are organisms that all evolved from a common ancestor. And so if you look here, this blue box is circling a clade. They have all evolved from some common ancestor represented right here, okay? So here's our common ancestor for all four of these organisms. Now these two, let's just label them A and B, okay? Those two have a common ancestor right here. Uh, that's their common ancestor. So those guys are pretty closely related. They have a common ancestor, and it's right here. C also has a common ancestor with A and B, and it's right here. Okay. And then D has a common ancestor with all four of them, and it's this large one that I circled originally. Okay. So this is the common ancestor for all four of these organisms. If I were to ask you what two organisms are the most closely related out of A, B, C, and D, you would say that A and B were most closely related because they have the most recent common ancestor. Right? Remember, time is going towards the top here. So this evolved, or this diverged, I should say, into two lines. 
much more recently than the other common ancestors did. Okay, You're going to see a lot of different trees. You're going to see circular trees, you're going to see rooted trees, and you're going to see unrooted trees. And basically they're all showing the same thing, but our, uh, our perspective shifts a little. So like with the circular trees, the original uh, or the origin of life is going to be at the center. And then as you move out in any direction, that's moving towards present day. And so all of the tips of these trees all around the circle are present day. Okay? Whereas a rooted tree is going to have the origin way at the beginning. And then as you move to the right in this case, we are moving towards present day. So here at the tips of the tree would be present day. Okay? And then an unrooted tree basically shows the same thing, except it kind of allows for some flexibility in terms of where they move things uh, and how they place them. This to me is the least useful tree. Um, so we're typically going to be using circular rooted trees and regular rooted trees. So clades are basically any group of organisms that all have that one common ancestor. And clades are going to include anything that is currently alive as well as anything else that might have been in that group that is no longer alive. So some clades are small and some clades are big. All right, and so clades are basically like what we name something. So like all of birds are one gigantic clade made up of 10,000 plus species. Okay. Now within that category of birds, within that clade of birds, there are other clades. There are clades of songbirds, for instance. So it's all about perspective, and that's going to become clear as we kind of go through here. But cladograms basically allow us to look at different groups. So here... I have a very small clade of amniotes because both of those organisms, all of the organisms in this tree make amniotic eggs. Okay, So the turtle and the leopard are a group of am amniotes. Okay? But I have other clades too. I have a clade of organisms with four walking legs, so tetrapods. I have a clade of hinged jaws. Okay? I have a clade of vertebrates. Uh, and then there's always going to be one that's kind of out, right? So there's always going to be an out group. And in this case, it's the lancelet. But basically, if I were looking at the clade of vertebrates, so everything inside of this outermost circle is a vertebrate, right? So if I get rid of the other circles, just to simplify things. Everything here that is circled is a vertebrate. So they all have this vertebral column. And so we're gonna do some uh, Chromebook activities that will help us to really get this down as well. But basically, if you have a trait on a tree, like vertebral column is right here, it's going to influence, it's going to impact all of the subsequent organisms. So everything downstream of that tree, or of that point on that tree, I should say, is going to have a vertebral column. Okay. Everything downstream of hinged jaws has a hinged jaw. So everything on this tree except for the lamprey and the lancelet has a hinged jaw. Okay. So you just have to get used to following the tree from base to tip and assigning those traits to the proper organisms. Okay. So you're, you're going to see a lot of different structures of these, but basically we can figure out what traits an organism has by looking at the traits on the tree. So if, for instance, I wanted you to tell me what traits a lizard has, okay, so here are my lizards, I need to look kind of working backwards. So here I see that they can see UV light. And then if I look back towards the beginning, I can see that they also have amniotic eggs, they have lungs, and they have vertebrae. Okay. So all of these things, if we were to go from the root of the tree to the tips of the tree, would affect the lizards, would describe the lizards. Okay. So we see this on a huge scale, and we see this with a lot of different organisms, and it's all relative. So like there are lots of different squirrel species, but in this case, we have squirrels just kind of all lumped together. And that is just to simplify things, because squirrels have a lot of stuff in common. And so I don't want to break down all of the species of squirrel, because that'll just confuse everyone. If it doesn't matter, like if we're not talking about different squirrels, just lump them all together. Okay. So those clades are what we call monophyletic groups. So like if you take a group and you're able to like circle it and say, okay, here's the common ancestor and that common ancestor led to all of these descendants, 
right? That is a monophyletic group because they came from a single common ancestor, thus monophyletic, okay? A polyphyletic group is made up of individuals that don't have a, an immediate uh, common ancestor, okay? So like a monophy or excuse me, a polyphyletic group would have two individuals that are related, but not to an immediate common ancestor. So like if we're only looking at these two individuals, E and G, their common ancestor is way back here at B, right? That's their most recent common ancestor. And so there's a lot of stuff missing there. So if we're only looking at those two groups, because maybe they're the ones that can fly, maybe this is a bat at E and this is a bird at G. It's not really that useful to talk about them because they got those traits separately, right? Uh, and then finally, we have a paraphyletic group. That's where you take a common ancestor, so in this case, A, and you look at some of its descendants. So we're looking at this group, but we're not looking at all of its descendants. Like, we don't care about all of these other ones. And this is all just arbitrary. We don't really need to be able to use these terms that often for this class, right? But basically, phylogenetic trees have organisms, and then how you look at those organisms matters. Okay. And so here we have two different terms. We have derived traits. So these are traits that are gained during evolution. So basically, they are all the traits that have evolved somewhere on the tree. Okay, so like amniotic egg right here, that's a derived characteristic or a derived trait. Okay. Uh, lost traits are traits that get lost during evolution. So it's something that like older organisms have, but at a certain point, it was lost, okay? So like tails, for instance, are present in our ancestors, but we no longer have tails, right? We have the remnants of a tail, but we do not have a tail. So that would be a lost trait in our lineage, right? And so number of heart chambers, for instance, has changed over time. Um, so the cladogram shows you different categories of hearts. We have three chambered hearts versus four chambered hearts. I don't need you to memorize that or anything. It's just another example of a trait that changes over time. Okay. And then we can also see stuff like opposable thumbs. Where do opposable thumbs actually evolve on primates? Okay. And then basically if I were to like look at just a general phylogeny, this is just like a general one. There's a couple things that we refer to. Uh, so the most recent common ancestor is going to be like way back at the base of the tree. Okay. A branch point is anywhere one line branches into two. Okay. So this right here is a branch point. Okay. If two groups are right next to each other on a tree, so they share like the most immediate common ancestor, we call those sister taxa okay, because they have the same common ancestor. Uh, so taxon B and C. So a taxon is just a group of organisms. So maybe this is frogs and toads, right? So frogs and toads have a common ancestor right here. So they are sister taxa. Frogs and toads are sister to one another. Okay. And then finally, we have a polytomy. And basically, a polytomy is a mistake. Okay. It's when one branch becomes three. And the only reason this should ever be on a phylogeny is if we don't have enough data. Because we know that one species only ever becomes two at any given point, right? No species evolves alongside another species at the exact same moment from one ancestral species, right? There's no one species becoming three. That doesn't happen. So we just need more data to figure that out. Okay. And then finally, on this tree, taxon G, so group G, whatever it is, butterflies, who cares, right? Group G is the basal taxon. It's the one that's furthest back. It evolved furthest back on the tree. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, this is going to be our out group. So like if there's some trait that describes these guys, so let's just say bones, okay? If bones evolved right here, every organism in this monophyletic group has bones. And the out group is taxon G. They don't have bones. Okay. And so we can see this with basically any tree. As you look back, you have a more basal group that has less in common with all the others. Okay. So basically the easiest way to make one of these trees is to create a matrix of traits. So basically you put all your organisms you have, 
So that's what I've done here on the left with traits, or excuse me, with the organisms column. And then along the top, you write all the traits. Okay, so like jaws, lungs, all the things that you have narrowed down that they have like that's different from one another. And you basically just put either a zero or a one. And a zero means they don't have it, and a one means they do have it. Okay. You could also do pluses and minuses. So like if they don't have it, you put a minus. If they do have it, you put a plus. Okay? And then that allows us to figure out how many of these traits each organism should have. So according to this chart, lamprey should have none of these six traits. And sure enough, we put lamprey as the outgroup, okay? Because we don't want them to have any of the traits. Shark should have lung, or excuse me, should have jaws, but none of the other traits, okay? So sharks are gonna evolve right after jaws. Here's jaws, sharks are the next organism, okay? Here's lungs, salamanders are next, because they don't have amniotic membranes, but they do have lungs and they do have jaws. All right, so it's basically a way to go from traits and pictures of organisms to a tree. <clears throat> it's a way to show how things evolved over time. And we can also do this with uh, actual DNA bases, okay? So we don't always have to do this with traits. We can do it with DNA changes because DNA changes over time. And so if your DNA makes like small adjustments, we can figure out who is more closely related to whom. And we can do this with a whole lot of stuff. And then DNA is basically treated like a molecular clock. Basically, we can figure out based on how many changes there were in the DNA, how long ago that DNA, you know, led to a new species. And so you don't need to know how to do that. You just need to know that we are able to do it. Basically, we can use DNA to work backwards and construct a cladogram or a phylogenetic tree. Okay. And we can do this with any organisms. We can do this with uh, primates, and we can do this with cats. Basically, anything that has DNA, we can use it. So phylogenetic trees are all hypotheses. So you should never look at a phylogenetic tree and just say, oh, okay, that's definitely how everything evolved. It's all just a representation of a hypothesis. We are not 100% sure. We're just constructing it based on the data we have. It could have evolved differently. So these things change all the time. And that's like really frustrating if you work with these things because you always have to like keep up with the times. You always have to look at all the recent cladograms and all the recent phylogenies and like make sure you're up to date. But that's how science works. You make changes when you get more data and then you rinse and repeat, right? And so this just shows that really, really closely. Another reason why it can be confusing is because Structures are sometimes really, really similar, even if they didn't evolve from the same thing. So like eyes, for instance, don't necessarily, just because they look so similar does not mean that they evolved in the same way. So what we often will do now is rely more on DNA than on morphology. It's better to use DNA and that molecular clock idea than it is to rely just on looks, okay? and because DNA is more predictable over time. And so basically, as our DNA technologies has got, have gotten better, we can better construct these cladograms because like if I gave you some data without any DNA information, I just gave you like morphological data, you could make a tree, and that's what's happened on the left here, but you group together these two that have long legs just because they have long legs. But that's not always true. So if you do it with DNA, and that's what's happening on the right side here, Long tails, you might have immediately thought like, oh, let's put the long tails together, right? Because they have long tails. So they're probably closely related. But if you look at the DNA, it's actually that they are analogous traits. So this bird on the left and this bird on the right both independently evolved long tails, completely unrelated to one another. So you might have thought, oh, let's put them together. But in reality, it was completely unrelated when they did it, okay? Um, your book will talk about a lot of different examples of reclassification, like what some of the stuff that we've changed. You don't need to memorize any of those. It's interesting. I love seeing how science changes over time, but it's not a thing that you should dedicate very much time to. And finally, here's just two other supplemental resources for cladograms and phylogenetic trees, basically how to construct them, what are they, and we're going to be practicing this a lot in class because it is something you need to be able to do for the AP test as well as my tests. So that's pretty much it. It all comes down to being able to look at it and figure out what it's trying to tell you and then being able to construct your own.